People forget Russia wanted to join NATO and they looked into joining. Since obviously the war has continued, Ukraine has managed to make sizable strikes and impacts into Russia's territory itself. Are you not concerned about those becoming a cause for escalation? This war particularly, it's not going to be Ukraine destroying 100% of Russia's army. The, the war is going to end within Russia itself, whether that's Putin dying or getting overthrown or their economy collapsing or just taking so many losses that they just can't do it anymore. This is The Global Gambit. Welcome back, everybody. This is a part two section to a two-parter with wonderful content creator and guest, Johnny FD. Uh, we had him on for a part about his personal experiences of YouTubing and building a channel and some really, really heartfelt, and I genuinely mean that, comments about what he experienced in Ukraine uh, in February 24th and around that period at the end of that video so i do encourage everybody to click through and watch part one if you haven't already it'll be on your screen now but in this i want to talk to johnny about the actual issue itself um jumping straight into it you were on the ground for a, a, a while in ukraine and you went back uh one of the notable things you said in our first conversation first part of our conversation was you being at a table with 20 or so soldiers and more journalists and you there and you decided to follow around the volunteers what was the general sentiment on the ground of Ukrainians at that point? It was one of shock, quite obviously, because a lot of Ukrainians didn't expect it to occur. But could you take us through a little bit what the sort of immediate reaction of the Ukrainian, you know, the Georgian Legion, and the Ukrainian volunteers supporting, and um, what you saw when you were going around Bucha uh, and some of the other areas uh, in April 2022? Yeah, so it, it was tough. Um... I I think when people look at you know my my videos now and Kiev is relatively you know I, I would say it's very safe now you know uh, besides mm -hmm. the 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 missile bombings it's very safe from you know an actual ground invasion because it's so far away but in April 2022 people were still worried that Russia may come with tanks and you know and or get into artillery range you know and, and this is something that. I never thought about as a as a civilian until I, I lived through this war. But there's a big difference be, between being in artillery range and being in a missile range. You know, mm -hmm. so now when uh, Ukraine's being bombed by by Russia, it's through you know long range you know Kinzhal missiles. You know that might cost a you know millions of dollars each, a hundred million dollars each. I mean, I think they spent a billion dollars the, the other night. You know, a combination of missiles and and uh and iranian drones so it's expensive they can't you know they can't really fire it day after day they, they need to resupply and um and plan it out while artillery it's it has a much shorter range you know they, they can't shoot it from you know 150 uh miles away but it's cheap and they can kind of just unload and say you know what <laughs> let's just destroy the city let's, let's flatten it that's the scary part, you know. That's much, much scarier. Uh, so I, I gave myself a rule from from day one uh, that I wasn't going to go into artillery range. I only broke that rule a few times. It was, it was <laughs> always by accident, you know. I, I think I've I've been, you know, within maybe five or ten kilometers from the Russian border and uh, near Kharkiv, um, probably in the very the the, the Russian volunteer units uh, penetrated uh, Belgorod from. Um, but I would say that in in the first months of the war, people were still very worried that Russia was going to come and launch a ground invasion, you know, or break through the lines. I, I, I don't remember when that specifically changed, but definitely, you know, by the one year anniversary, you know, people knew there was almost zero chance Russia was going to make any any more um and, and and any more you know ground moves uh, that are going to be significantly towards Kiev. I mean, they're you know, they had their chance and and you know they dropped the ball on it. Yeah, I think that one of the things that was very interesting for me and notable in the first two months when initial reviews of Russia's well, they Detroit, um uh, initial invasions on February twenty fourth was that it started off pretty. Uh, comprehensive. You lead with aerial bombardment, you lead with paratroopers in certain key areas, but then it began to fall apart in the sense that the Russians were bringing in sort of 
shell regiments to take specific strategical points, but they weren't backing it out with the rest of the military. So you had lots of posts being taken by conscripts also who didn't even know what they were there for. They thought they were a training mission in Crimea. And suddenly the Russians are not undertaking sort of what would be considered to be good strategical military doctrine. So it then suddenly allows the Ukrainians to get their, their themselves together uh, and begin to push back. And because the Russians haven't brought in the rest of the military, um, they don't have the capacity to hold those lines or to, to prevent the Ukrainians from actually, well, resisting. Um, is that something that you saw yeah. um, or, or it's a bit more nuanced yeah. than that? So even from day one, you know, I have friends who uh, were part of uh, territorial defense, you know, just outside of Kiev, and they went to Gostomol, the airport, where mm. you know Russia had landed their paratroopers. You know, and paratroopers are, are Russia's versions of kind of the elite. Uh, kind of think of it as the, you know, the Green Beret of, of the UK or uh, the Navy SEALs of the US, where you know they send them in, you know, well trained special forces, but you know they have no backing. There's no, you know, there's no. Uh, armor. There's no tanks. There's no, you know, th- there's no artillery to 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 fight with. They just got basically dropped off and said, "Okay, here you are." <laughs> okay. the and airport. yeah, the airport. And they're like, "Take the airport so we can land our um, our transport, you know, cargo, you know, and that'll contain the the, the tanks and, and and everything." And uh, to be fair, they. They were trying to bring in tanks from Belarus, uh, and I don't know if it it was so much Russia had just bad military doctrine, or it was just a failed mission because there was so much there is so much corruption in 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 Russia that so many of the vehicles are just poorly maintained. You know they had. You know, ordered you know cheap tires from from China, and everybody had pocketed money. You know, nothing nothing just worked. So, I think it was a combination of both. You know, bad doctrine where they thought it'd be easy. They thought they'd be you know uh, welcomed by the Ukrainians. Uh, they thought that Zelensky was going to flee and run to Poland and just give up the you know the, the White House, basically. You know, the or at least the the, the government um, you know uh, position. But when the territorial defense was able to basically, you know, outlast the 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 airborne units uh, and prevent the the the, the transport landings of, of of backup, that was kind of the the first big twenty point. I, I think a lot of people don't give that that day enough credit. Mm. If the territorial defense, you know, didn't show up and weren't able to fight off the you know th- that airport, and Russia was able to hold it and land uh, reinforcements. Kiev would have been in a lot more danger. It it it, it would have changed the tide oh. of the war. Oh no, hundred percent. The um the ability to fend off the Russian paratroopers, which to be fair, I mean, given their size and the fact that they weren't backed up by military vehicles coming through via Belarus or something, was in in itself quite surprising. But eventually, the Ukrainians did push them out. And and ensure the perimeter of of Kiev was was maintained. One of the things that also strikes me more broadly, and even now, uh, getting into debates that I do on the internet on Twitter, is this sort of desire to put the framing into well, who's winning or who's losing, but that's not really how military objectives work. And it's pretty clear that the Russian military objective from day one was not just to take control of uh, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson. It was to force the removal and regime change of the entire government and mm-hmm. therefore by de facto control mm-hmm. in Ukraine. That didn't happen. So then the Russians, by what, May, June, reform their strategical objectives to, no, we just want to take over the Russian, you know, um, populated areas of Ukraine. Not really, guys. It's pretty clear that you wanted to control the whole of Ukraine. So if anyone is losing more, it's Russia because they're not adhering to their original objectives. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if that's what you you feel or or have felt over the time uh, or, or have your sentiments changed as the war has um, progressed. So I used to, you know, 
respond to all the all the, the Twitter comments and the YouTube comments of people who seemed like they had a somewhat legitimate argument. They're like, well, you know, Russia wanted to defend the, you know, this, so that therefore that's why they invaded. You know, and then you know, I would I would give them a very good response on on why, you know, that was incorrect. Or, you know, for example, if Russia's goal was to help the Russian speakers of Ukraine, why are they only killing Russian speakers in Ukraine? You know, the all the they, like all the Ukrainian speakers, they mostly have haven't had their houses destroyed, they haven't been displaced, they haven't been raped and murdered. It's Russian soldiers are primarily killing Russian Russian speakers, and. It, that just never, you know, made any sense. You know, um, you know the, you know Russia, you know, saying, you know, oh, it's it's because of the NATO expansion. Well, when Finland, you know, uh, said, hey, we're, you know, we're going to join, Russia no. was like, oh, it's fine. Like, you know, they, they didn't say anything. You know, now they're they're doing some um, passive aggressive moves with, you know, sending legal migrants, you know, to the border. But, you know, they could have prevented. Uh, Finland from joining, you know, they could have started a war with them, but they didn't, they, you know, before they joined. A lot of people don't realize that one of the the rules of joining NATO is you can't have any active conflicts. So the easiest way for Russia to, to start mm-hmm. um, to prevent, a, a, you know, NATO, you know, a, a new NATO country is just to start a conflict in that, you know, in that country. You know, that's partially the reason why um, they're you know occupying parts of Georgia. That's why they're in you know Transnistria and Moldova. They just like instability. They're like okay, you know, we'll keep everyone a little bit on edge, and that way, you know, uh, that way you know no no one gets too strong. With Ukraine, Ukraine was never going to be able to join NATO if it, if Russia didn't invade. It takes a hundred times more truth to combat. You know, a piece of uh, misinformation than just a spread. You know, misinformation like wildfire. There's a you know an exercise in futility to a point, isn't there? After a while, and I think one of the things that I'd like your take on in this sort of string of discussions is the claim about NATO expansion. Now, the 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 common emphasis is that you know the George H. W. Bush administration promised. The Soviets, that's the key point, actually, one of the key points, it wasn't the Russian Federation, it was the Soviets, not to expand. And then pro-Russian shills like to emphasize, or pro-Kremlin shills like to emphasize that it's, you know, uh, the, the NATO broke its promise. But it wasn't a written verbal, a, a written declaration. It was a verbal agreement from a previous administration to a previous non-existent state Uh, And that all changed after, well, 1990, 1991. Um, Why why is there a deliberate attempt to blur history in this way, do you think? Why, why? Even when you've got the facts in front of you, they constantly just come back at you with, what about isms, um, exaggerations, manipulation of history and facts? You know, you've had this experience on your channel, I presume. How do you (laughs) navigate this? Yeah. It's hard to to argue with people that already have made up their minds because you can always find you know some some little misnomer or a little uh, grain of truth in something, right? And and it's it's always how far back do you want to take something? So, for example, you know you can argue that everything that the U.S. does is bad because the U.S. you know is shouldn't exist anyways because it was founded on you know uh, Native American land. You know, and, and they say, you know, uh, America's, you know, occupying Native American land. Therefore, they're the bad guys. You know, someone from invading a country today in 2024, you know, saying, well, you know, the, the U.S. kicked out the Native Americans. Therefore, we should be able to go and kill, you know, 100,000 people here today. And first off, you know, the, the cycle always needs to end somewhere. Yes, yes you know, all big nations have historically have had wars. Historically... Uh, nations were, you know, were bigger, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, the USSR uh, or, you know, the Austrian Hungarian Empire. But you could also argue, I can say, well, my ancestors, the Mongolians, you know, were in in Russia. You know, maybe we should take back Russia. And it seems like with the Russian logic, the only reason why 
we can't is because you know, we're not strong enough. So, you know, Mongolia is not strong enough to take, to take back, um, you know, historical territory. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you know, uh, we don't have the right to it, but you know, you can bend rules. You can say, well, you know, Chinese Mongolia is strong enough. <laughs> Maybe China should take parts of Russia back. You know, would that be okay? You know, and, you know, you know, maybe someone had some kind of verbal deal with someone saying, you know, this and that. But at the end of the day, if something is not a, you know, it's not enforceable uh, and it's not enforceable by a third party that happens to be stronger, you know, nothing, nothing matters. You know, it, it, the, the NATO expansion clause something that was said, you know, th- that was never, it was never written down. It was never enforceable. And at the same time, you know, it's, uh, people, people forget Russia wanted to join NATO and they looked into join NATO. Then they started their own version. I will be hundred percent honest, you know, before Russia invaded in 2022, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. You know, I, I also wouldn't want, you know, a stronger neighboring pact to expand. How about Ukraine just stay neutral? Let's just, you know, Ukraine be like Switzerland. You know, th- there's no reason to join, you know, um, a defense pact. You know, there's there's no reason to have to defend anything. You know, I, everyone should just live in peace and, and harmony. So if Russia didn't actually invade and if they had just said, OK, we're flexing our troops to show you that we're, you know, we're strong and we're pissed off. Please sign an actual agreement saying Ukraine will never join NATO and then we'll withdraw our troops from the border. I think Ukraine would have happily done that. Uh, you know, a sense of neutrality being what we call in IR academia a bridge state is uh, is is you know they were quite happy to be that sort of equivalent of Austria in that in that capacity. But exposure to Western culture, the money that was coming in, and the impact that was having on uh, Ukrainian society, on infrastructure, on opportunities, as you mentioned in part one, which people should you know go and see. Those are, are factors that I don't think the Kremlin could handle. Uh, and the fact that they felt that they were losing Ukraine and therefore the Russian population and the Kievan Rus, the jewel in the crown, sort of equivalent of the former Russian Empire to the West, which Putin, you know, cannot handle. But I, I think one, one other thing I'm curious for your take on is since obviously the war has continued, Ukraine has managed to make a few quite sizable strikes and impacts into Russia's territory itself. Are you not concerned about those becoming a cause for escalation? Um, You know, the Russians potentially using a limited tactical nuke, not all out strategical nukes, but, you know, a specific strike somewhere, or, 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 or you feel that they would have done it by now? First off, they would have done it by now. Um, second, it's I mean, Russia would love to use it, but the repercussions of it are just not worth it for them. Mm. I mean, first off, they are already turning into a, a pariah, but they still have countries that are willing to work with them. You know, whether it's India and China, um, you know, all, all the, the BRICS countries, you know, and if they actually used any type of nuke, whether it's tactical nuke, uh, especially if they use something, you know, bigger, even China – and even India would finally shun away and say, they said, we cannot be associated with this, you know? Um, and I think that's why they haven't used it. Secondly, it wouldn't change the, the front line enough to be, to be worth it. I mean, I, I honestly believe that if Putin could, sh- you know, send one tactical nuke and then co- instantly win the war, he'd probably do it anyways, just because he's in such a bad position now uh, where he would take that gamble, even though it's going to be very devastating, the consequences. But if he can, you know, send one barrage of tackler nukes to the front line, win the war tomorrow, he'd probably do it. But at the same time, a tackler nuke, you know, isn't going to completely change um, the war. It's also so close to Russian territory. I mean, you know, especially if that's territory that they actually were hoping to actually administer in the future. They don't want to blight it. That's really all Russia has is the threat of using a nuke. Because if it wasn't for that, nobody would take Russia seriously. You know, their their economy. I mean, their their actual GDP, what they actually produce to the world. It, it, they're basically, you know, I, I think someone said they're a gas station with, you know, with nuclear weapons. That would be John McCain. 
That'll be Senator John McCain, yeah. um, I think, in 2008 when he was running uh, for office. But, okay, so that's interesting. What about um, we, as we enter 2024, uh, I know some people don't like this term, but it is used of war fatigue, that the counteroffensive, the long-anticipated counteroffensive of last year wasn't, um, didn't yield the results that were desired. What do you think... Um, uh, is going to happen this year um, in in the uh, short to medium term, you know, as we enter the, as we're still in winter, but enter the spring and then summer months. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there'll be a, a sustained effort or do you think there might be a shift from the West in sort of saying, look, Ukraine, we've got to make a, um, a, a, a we've got to think about reality here. So I think it would have been really nice to have made, you know, massive gains um, on the front line or, you know, cut off, um, you know, Russian access to, to Crimea. You know, wars are not, Lot on the front line, you know, and and this war particularly, it's not going to be Ukraine destroying 100 percent of Russia's army. It's going to have to, you know, the the war is going to end within Russia itself, whether that's Putin dying or getting overthrown or their economy collapsing or them just taking so many losses that they just can't do it anymore, or them taking one of the many outs that they've had and just declaring a victory, even though it probably wasn't worth it. You know, I, I remember there was a few times where Russia had minor victories where they could have easily just said, okay, special military option, you know, operation is over. The one that stuck in my head the most was pretty early on in the war when they took uh, Azovstal and they took uh, you know, hundreds of, of prisoners, mostly from um, Azov. They could have paraded them around saying, we captured all the Nazis, we won. You know, war, you know, uh, the war is over, and people would have cheered for Putin. They would have called him, you know, hero, even though BS made up and Mirapol was destroyed because because of of the fighting. They could have easily stopped and, and declared a, a victory, but you know, he didn't. Um, I don't think this war is going to end on the battlefield, unfortunately. But I do think that Russia is is built on a house of cards, and I can't imagine that their their economy. And their, you know, system is gonna be able to, to to hold on for another year. You know, unfortunately, they've bypassed a lot of sanctions um, through parallel imports or through artificially keeping their their ruble up. All that's costing Russia a lot of money. And and you know, with as long as gas prices and oil prices stay relatively low, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to to do this forever. No, I I, I think unfortunately there is a. A bit of a realization settling in among certain states, mm-hmm. but that in itself is also a problem because as some countries pivot one way over the issue and others pivot another way, that plays into Putin's ability to manipulate Western disunity and also particularly not just government minds, but the population minds, which to go back to what we were talking about botting earlier, it once, once it even begins to seep in a little bit, you, you can capitalize on that and Russia is unfortunately a well. It's, a, it's an in-demand state, whether you like it or not. Um, and the Indians, particularly, which we, we've had lots of com- conversations on, you know, are going to leverage their strategical autonomy in that they will continue to trade mm-hmm. with Russia for what? How much discounted gas and oil have they had from the Russians? It's ridiculous. Um, if it serves their interests, mm-hmm. um, and, and China, which is actually what I do want to ask you a little bit about now, is. Russia has obviously set the precedent for larger states dealing with smaller states um, on certain interests. And obviously the notion about Taiwan and China is constantly in the back of policymakers and observers' heads. And with your personal heritage to Taiwan, what do you feel about the way that the situation in Ukraine is going vis-a-vis um, Taiwan and China? Yeah, it was actually one of the biggest dangers uh, and fears that we had within, you know, my family and and friends, um, you know, in the beginning of the war was if Ukraine fell and Russia didn't have any major repercussions, China would look at that and say, oh, that's a green light, where if the U.S. and the West didn't get involved um, in, you know, the affairs of Ukraine and, and Russia, they're probably not going to get involved in, in Taiwan uh, and China, especially if we kind of give the same BS reasons, you know, historically, um, you know, you, you know, 
you belong to us or, you know, we're here to, to save the Chinese speaking people, you know, you know, whatever same um, BS reasons they gave. Luckily, it's been so hard for Russia to, to, you know, really gain in anything from this. And there's been so much Western support that China is looking at that and saying, this is not worth it for us. Like it's 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 going to be a hard battle that's going to cost us a lot. And Russia, you know, China is going to um, invade Taiwan anytime soon. Uh, I actually have a trip planned there in a few months <laughs> with my parents. Uh, uh, flying them out there, you know, they haven't they haven't been back in a while, and I haven't seen them. So instead of going back to the U.S., I'm going to fly them there. I'm going to going to have a little holiday. But it was uh, it was one of those one of those things that we talked about last year. We're like, you know what, you know, they can't come to Ukraine because uh, it's dangerous. Uh, they didn't want to go to Taiwan at the time because it was, uh, you know, potentially dangerous, and I didn't want to go back to the U.S. because it's far. Um, but now we feel safe enough to go back to Taiwan. We don't think that's going to happen in the next, you know, few months at least. If you're talking about the next five or ten years, eventually all conflicts, you know. Uh, turn into war. Right? I, I don't think you could have a, a border dispute or you know territory dispute just kind of simmer forever. I, I think eventually you have to take care of it. Yeah, I think China is facing economic headwinds. The golden opportunity for some kind of campaign. Uh, a lot of people put towards twenty twenty seven, but well, that's nearing quite quickly. And generally, I think Xi's got to get a hold of stuff. The uh, the you know. Being overtaken by India, most populous country, seeing its population actually reduce for the first time in how many decades, and also just the remnants of COVID and just so many domestic issues is is influencing China's foreign policy. And I think we're playing this out in how Xi is actually being quite reluctant, reconciliatory uh, in his rhetoric and behaviour um, on the international stage. I think uh, APEC, um, which I had a good chat with a chap from Nikkei Asia Times on, but. Um, I guess my last question for you, uh, Johnny, is, you know, what are the main takeaways you would you would have for people who, you know, pay attention to your work, to your content? Um, what do you think will happen um, or, or what should we be on the lookout for in, in terms of the next short to medium term? I really generally, you know, sincerely hope that nobody ever has to go through uh, an evasion or war. You know, it, it's very easy to, you know, pick it apart from a comment box behind your laptop or save somewhere. It's very easy to think, well, you know, if that happened in my country, you know, this is what I would do, you know, or those people deserved it because of this. Nothing can can prepare prepare you for it. I am glad that there are documentaries out now, like 20 Days of Maripol. And I hope that's the closest all of you ever actually get to one. In Taiwan, you know, I've been there many, many times when there was, you know, threats from China, nothing ever happened. And that's why I was maybe falsely comfortable when I was in Ukraine thinking, yeah, you know, in this country, it definitely won't happen because people in, you know, civilians in Russia and Ukraine actually like each other, you know, in China and Taiwan, a little bit different when you're writing comments on, whether it's on YouTube or on Twitter, realize that, like, please realize that there's real people suffering. You know, it's just not numbers. And even if you want to be right, being right or, you know, factually correct about something isn't the whole picture. At the end of the day, Russia invaded Ukraine. And if if that, if they never brought troops into the country, nothing else would have happened. You know, I I don't care what people, you know, said before or after or any excuses on, on why they're doing it. Or little nuances, you know, here or there. Everything that's happening in Ukraine, every single person who's died since 2022 has Russian blood on it. And if Putin wanted, he can call off this this war and this invasion any day. He can literally, you know, make a speech say, "Guys, we've won. We've we've achieved our goals. Come home." Ukraine can't do that. They have to fight. Mm. And whether Western support continues. Ukraine is going to fight. So, you know, we might as well give them what they need. Yeah, it makes me think of the statement, if Russia stops fighting, there'll be no more war. But if Ukraine stops fighting, there'll be no more Ukraine. And I think that the events before February 24th were at a certain level, right? There was conflict, but it was a certain status quo. And things changed because one specific side decided to change 
gigs. Uh, and I and I find it hard to ever really take anyone seriously or listen to them when they try to sort of say that the longer term emphasis is of well, everything that we've discussed uh, in this episode. But uh, Johnny, thank you. It's been a real pleasure uh, for both parts. Um, this one, I have to say, I really enjoyed. I loved hearing about your personal story, but there's not so much I can really add. And in this one, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can actually sort of hopefully add something of value in the conversation as well. So it's been <laughs> really, really fun. To all your viewers and to everyone else who's tuned in, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please yeah. subscribe, give it a thumbs up, all that jazz. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in a future episode. But until then, everyone, take care.